Hello comrades, and welcome to another video on the Chinese Revolution area of study one. In this video, we're going to be looking at the Guomindang in what is known as the Nanjing decade. So the previous decade from 1917 to 1927 is known as the warlord decade when there was no real central government in China. And the Nanjing decade refers, for, refers to 1927 uh, to 1937. Um, when the Guomindang, led by Jiang Jieshi, um, controlled and had uh, controlled a more unified China. So this quote from Jiang Jieshi um, might give you an insight into uh, his attitude towards China and his um, attitude towards himself. He says, I am the generalissimo. China cannot do well without me. A little arrogant, it sounds like, um, but we'll find out a bit more uh, in this video. So first, let's have a look at Jiang and the nationalist state. So on the 18th of April, 1927, nationalist there was a nationalist government founded in Nanjing. Now, if we contextualize this, uh, this came mere days after the Shanghai massacre. So Nanjing had already been captured um, on the Northern Expedition uh, in March. And in um, April, the 12th of April, there was the Shanghai massacre when um, thousands of communists and communist sympathizers were massacred by um, nationalist army uh, members uh, loyal to Jiang Jiexia. Uh, as well as members of Shanghai's Green Gang, <clears throat> uh, led by Big Ears Do, as we remember from last time. Um, so just a few days later, a nationalist government was founded in Nanjing. However, the unification of China under Guomindang rule uh, wasn't completed until uh, the capture of Beijing in June 1928, so a full over a year after the nationalist government was founded. Um, so that marked the completion of the Northern Expedition with Beijing, uh, which was uh, renamed Beiping, um, being the northernmost city uh, on the Northern Expedition and the location of the previous uh, central government under Yuan Shikai. Um, on the 10th of October 1928, Jiang was inaugurated as president and the structure of his government was formalized. Now, before I mention the structure of his government, 10th of October, that is a very significant date. Uh, as we know um, from previous videos and from um, class, uh, the 10th of October 1911 was the date of <clears throat> the um, Xinhai 1911 revolution when a bomb accidentally went off sparking the beginning of the, triggering the beginning of the uh, 1911 revolution. So 10th of October 1911 was the um, Xinhai revolution. 17 years later to the day, Jiang was inaugurated as president. Uh, so his government was structured with five main parts. There was the, and they were known as um, Yuan. So there was the executive Yuan, which was Jiang and his government. There was the legislative Yuan, which was the parliament. The judiciary Yuan, which was the legal system. The examination Yuan, which was to do with civil service appointments. And the control Yuan, which was um, related to behavior and standards in the bureaucracy, sort of checks and balances uh, and anti-corruption sort of stuff. Uh, in March 1929, uh, the Guomindang announced that the party would monopolize power on behalf of the people for the period of political tutelage. Um, and this was in line with Sun Yixian's three principles. As you'll remember, um, the uh, first part of the transition to democracy within Sun Yixian's three principles of the people was a military dictatorship for three years and then six years of a tutelage period in which um, democracy was tested and trialed and um, explained to the masses. So uh, in March 20, 1929, uh, the GMD announced um, that they would monopolize power uh, for the period of political tutelage. So no one else could, could attain power. Um, all major positions in the government were held by senior GMD members. So they were really a one party state. 
Uh, Clicks and factions. So by 1931, Jiang had assumed the title Generalissimo, which means General of Generals. Jiang maintained his authority uh, by being a part of several cliques or factions. Um, these included the family clique, who was people with links to the Song family. Um, now, uh, Song Ching Ling was the third wife of Sun Yuxian, and the Song family was a very powerful family uh, in China. Um, so the family clique was people with links to the Song family, which allowed Zhang to emphasize his supposed close relationship with Sun Yuxian. Uh, the Huang Pu clique, which I'm sure you can, if you remember what the Huang Pu Military Academy was, I'm sure you can imagine what this uh, clique was to do with. Uh, so that is the military and a secret society called the Blue Shirts, who we will find out um, more about later. Um, and the political study clique. Um, and this was associated with financial investors and the right-wing faction of the GMD. There was also another clique called the CC clique, but I won't get into that. <clears throat> um, other factions um, were um, around and aimed to limit Jiang Jiexia's authority. Uh, both Wang Jingwei, who, as you'll remember, was from the left faction of the GMD, and Hu Han Min from the right faction of the GMD, held important positions in the government uh, and used their influence to undermine Jiang. Uh, Wang even formed a rival government in opposition to Nanjing. Now, with its cliques and factions, the nationalist government really struggled to maintain unity and cohesion. Regional pressures. Uh, so here is a quote from historian Lucien Bianco. Uh, he says, peace and order were relative, just as the unification achieved in this decade was more apparent than real. So that appears to be saying that um, th some people could s consider this time peaceful and orderly, um, but some may not. Uh, some may consider this time a period of unification of all of China, um, but that was not necessarily the reality at this time. Um, so there were several occasions in the 1930s when militarist uh, provincial governors broke away from Nanjing and ruled their domains independently from the GMD government. Um, they ruled similar to warlords, but weren't didn't have the title of warlords. Um, 23 campaigns <clears throat> were military campaigns were waged by the uh, nationalist army to try and subdue rebellious provinces, which is rather telling. Um, it shows that there were multiple um, rebellions and um, breakaway um, uh, provinces. Uh, now, as we can see in this map, um, all of these areas um, in green, uh, so here, number eight, where's number eight? Guizhou, uh, Nanjing controlled from 1936. Um, all these, these uh, green areas, uh, essentially the areas that were controlled by the Nanjing government. There is Nanjing, there is Shanghai, uh, Guangdong, um, Hunan, including Changsha, uh, was under uh, the leadership of warlord Ho Qian. Um, and the northern regions uh, were either independent of Nanjing, under Japanese control, such as uh, Korea, um, or a Japanese puppet state. So up here, right in the north of China, is Manchu Kuo, which was previously Manchuria. And if you'll remember from The Last Emperor, um, Manchu Kuo uh, was where Puyi resettled uh, in the 1930s as a puppet emperor um, under, under the control of the Japanese. Uh, now, these yellow um, regions here, uh, including Chongqing, Sichuan, uh, they were ruled by autonomous warlords. So while we uh, talk about the Nanjing decade as a period of unification, it was really only um, 
unification that unification wasn't necessarily the reality um only these green areas were truly unified under um Jiang's government uh so as it says here the Nanjing government held direct control of only four provinces in the central Yanzi region uh those being Zhejiang uh, excuse my pronunciation uh Anhui Jiangsu and Jiangxi uh, the GMD also had strong influence in Guangdong, um, which is not surprising since that's where the Northern Expe Expedition launched from. Um, but other provinces were governed by provincial governors outside the influence of Jiang's government. <clears throat> now, there was a lack of strong centralized rule. Uh, and this, as, as we just saw, uh, and this really limited the nationalist government's ability to collect tax income, uh, which led to many financial challenges. Um, first of all, income tax was difficult to enforce and collect, uh, and provincial leaders who maybe separated themselves from the central government imposed and requisitioned taxes as they wished. Um, the government was continually short of funds, uh, partly due to the fact that there were many rebellions taking place. And so the cost of these unification campaigns launched by Jiang's government meant that up to 80% of government spending went on the military. Um, so that's a huge amount of um, uh, finances going towards military spending. Uh, the GMD government budget was in deficit, um, which essentially means that they were spending more than they were making um, throughout the entire Nanjing decade, with the government spending yet yeah, more than it had coming in. Uh, inflation became an issue in the later years of Kuomintang rule, and we'll talk a bit more about that shortly. Um, now, we've mentioned some of the negatives, uh, some of the um, sort of facades, such as the fact that it perhaps wasn't as unified as, um, as we like to think. Um, however, there were many modernization programs um, that took place under Jiang's leadership uh, that were really quite um, positive and progressive. Um, so here's a quote from historian William Kirby. He says, the nationalists made stunning accomplishments from a position of unenviable weakness. So there were accomplishments. It wasn't all failure for Jiang and his government. Now, these uh, accomplishments um, fall under four broad categories, transport and communications, construction, finance, and Chinese sovereignty. In terms of transport and communications, rail tracks were extended and new stations built and just basically railway infrastructure um, in the areas controlled by the Nanjing government uh, were really modernized and updated. Um, thousands of kilometers of new roads and bridges were built. Uh, buses and trams became more common in the main cities of Nanjing, Shanghai, and Beiping. Um, a Chinese airline was founded, so really uh, coming into the modern world here. Um, the number of post offices increased and the um, efficiency of the postal service was improved. Uh, and a network of radio stations was also set up. Uh, in terms of construction, power plants and factories were built with the cotton industry in particular um, thriving in this time. Uh, new hospitals, uh, including one of international standard in Nanjing were built uh, and flood control walls were built in some agricultural regions to protect uh, crops. Uh, in terms of finance, TV Song, uh, someone from the Song family who we mentioned before, um, was Jiang's finance minister and he reformed the banking sector. The Central Bank of China was established and a modern style annual budget was devised. Um, the Shanghai Stock Exchange also um, uh, really boomed, becoming an international financial market. Uh, and in terms of Chinese sovereignty, many Western claims over parts of China were dissolved and the right to charge tariffs and customs duties was given back to the Chinese. So basically being able to get the revenue that they deserved from uh, foreign powers who used uh, Chinese ports and things like that. 
Um, 20 of the 33 foreign concessions administered by European powers were given up and back to China. Uh, and China began to, as a result of all of this, um, gain greater respect from other nations. They had more diplomats, uh, you know, going to like, the League of Nations uh, and other similar um, multilateral organizations. Uh, and so they really started to be uh, more internationally um, respected. Uh, now, some of the limitations of Jiang's government. Now, we've touched on a couple of them, but let's go into a bit more detail. So in terms of inflation, with 80% of government spending going towards the military, like I said before, um, TV Song resigned um, from his post as finance minister uh, in 1933. His replacement, H.H. H. Kung, dealt with the crisis by printing more banknotes. Now, if you remember from war communism in, in Russia, um, if you print too many banknotes, that's going to lead to inflation and eventually hyperinflation where uh, goods are, basically money is no longer um, viable. Uh, so in the 1940s, there were high levels of inflation. By 1945, inflation became hyperinflation. And by 1949, which is the year that um, the Chinese Communist Party um, under Mao's leadership took control of China, um, China's monetary system had collapsed entirely. Uh, now, there was also another financial um, limitation uh, for Jiang's government. There was excessive taxation. So, I mentioned this briefly before, but again, let's go into a bit more detail. Provincial governments were slow to pass taxes that they'd collected onto the Nanjing government. Uh, and they often imposed their own special taxes on everyday items. Um, some officials collected more tax than they should or collected tax several years in advance. A hilarious um, example is that uh, 1971 taxes in Sichuan province were collected by 1933. So um, collecting taxes long before they're due. Um, in other provinces, taxes were 11 times higher than the official rate. Um, and these were collected between October 1931 and March 1933. Uh, now, along with land scarcity, soil exhaustion and exploitation, this caused most peasants to suffer terrible poverty. So, I mean, if we think a bit more about that, it's not just that peasants were really poor, but they were seeing that their life under the nationalist government was worse than their life was before under Qing rule um, and under an imperial uh, government. So with their life getting progressively worse, it seems likely, and as we'll see in our next video, uh, that peasants are going to look elsewhere, look for um, other um, possible options for um, government that would be more beneficial to them. Uh, so corruption is the um, last limitation that we're going to look at. So Jiang Jiexue, um, now this, this is also corruption and laziness within the um, administration. So here's a great quote from Jiang Jiexue that particularly highlights the laziness of many of his um, uh, people in his government. He says, I have observed that many of my staff members do not seem to know what they are supposed to do, while others do not know how to work at all. That is why our organization becomes worse and worse. So there was a serious problem with uh, laziness, incompetence and corruption in Zhang's government. Uh, and in the year 1931 to 1937, the control yuan, which was the anti-corruption uh, department um, of the government uh, received 69,500 reports about infringements by GMD officials. So, you know, uh, um, accusations of corruption and mismanagement. Um, however, only a couple of hundred of these reports were ever addressed um, and only less, less than 50 um, people were ever fired from their posts as a result of these thousands of reports of corruption. So there were many limitations to Zhang, Zhang's government. Now, we'll move briefly on to a 
movement uh, that was that took place um, in the 1930s under Jiang's leadership. Um, and when we have a look at the study design, you'll see that um, one of the uh, key knowledge points is to do with the um, with how popular movements help mobilize society. Um, and uh, we've already looked at the new youth, uh, sorry, we've, we've already looked at the new culture movement uh, and at the May 4th movement, which were really sort of youth driven, intellectual driven movements that were quite revolutionary uh, and sought new ways of thinking. Um, the new life movement is sort of the opposite. So on the 19th of February, 1934, the new life movement was launched by Jiang's government to try and bring about national moral rejuvenation through discipline and traditional values. Jiang Jiexue hoped that people would re-embrace re re Confucian value, uh, virtues uh, of social decency, right conduct, honesty, and self-respect. Historian Rana Mitter is quoted as saying that the New Life Movement aimed to create a citizenry that was self-aware, politically conscious, and committed to the nation. Um, however, it tried to do this in, in sort of peculiar ways, trying to um, make bring in more traditional values and discipline among the um, citizens. Um, the New Life Movement brought in 96 rules that detailed ideal behavior including rules on personal hygiene and manners. Um, people loyal to, now you'll see a, a list of these, uh, of some of these 96 rules in your textbook. Um, I'm just gonna try and find it now. Uh, so these rules included, uh, clothing should be tidy and clean, hats should be worn straight, do not scold, swear at, or hit others, be punctual for appointments, uh, reduce the number of meaningless parties or gatherings, go to bed early and rise early, keep your face clean, breathe fresh air, comb your hair, do not eat snacks, do not get drunk, do not smoke, exterminate flies, that's a very strange one, keep windows open as much as possible, say good morning to others every morning, you get the idea. It's rules about how people should live um, to be... Um, polite uh, members of society that embrace uh, Confucian values that have been around for thousands of years. Now, people loyal to the nationalist regime enforce these rules through methods of violence and intimidation. Um, on top of that, women were meant to regulate the household and were required to dress modestly. Uh, now, um, if we think about the role of women in um, the revolution, you will see when we um, start learning more about the CCP that similar to Bolshevik Russia, communist Russia, um, women were um, given far more freedoms and um, were seen as equal or at least equitable in society. The new life movement uh, brought about more traditional roles, gender roles. And so it was sort of a backward step for many sort of new age women who um, had been mobilized by the likes of the new culture movement and the May 4th movement. So this movement is sort of the opposite to those other two. Like I said before, um, it really took a backward step for a China that was really trying to modernize and um, come into the uh, 20th century and come into uh, the modern world. Now, this last slide uh, is about Jiang Jiexue and um, accusations that he was a fascist. Uh, historian Frederick Wakeman describes Jiang's ideology as Confucian fascism. And Jiang was uh, supposedly inspired by the likes of Mussolini and Hitler around this time. This is, of course, just before World War II. Um, Jiang is quoted as saying, can fascism save China? 
We answer yes. Fashion, fascism is now what China most needs. And in this picture, he does look a bit like a fascist, doesn't he? Uh, in 1932, a secret brotherhood called the Blue Shirts was founded at the Huangpu Military Academy. Now, we mentioned the Blue Shirts before, and I told you we'd get back to them. They swore an oath to advance Jiang's supreme leadership by any means, including violence. And it's estimated that by 1935, there were 14,000 blue shirts who infiltrated many organizations such as the police, uh, banks, the military, um, the, uh, and the bureaucracy. Uh, the blue shirts assassinated thousands of communists and communist agitators. Now, the nationalists claimed that 24,000 communists and 150,525 left-wing sympathizers were arrested and reformed between 1927 and 1937. On the flip side, communist sources claim that during this same 10-year span, the GMD murdered around 300,000 people um, who were committed to the communist cause. So you know, it's, it's unclear which side is right or which side is more right, but you can see that there are different historical perspectives here based on, depending on whether um, they were nationalists or communists. Historian C.P. Fitzgerald says that the Chinese people groaned under a regime fascist in every quality except efficiency. So, the GMD decade, sorry, the Nanjing decade for the Guomindang under Jiang Jiexia's leadership uh, was one of enormous change. There was quite a lot of um, there were quite a lot of positive moves made to modernize China, but there were also many backward steps, uh, many returns to traditional values, uh, and this perhaps wasn't what many people in China were really seeking. Um, the new culture movement and the May 4th movement showed that young people in particular were really ready for um, changes to Chinese culture and changes and moves away from these traditional values. And if we think about the fact that the new culture movement and the May 4th movement happened 15, 20 years before the introduction of the new life movement, um, you can imagine that these um, what were students and young intellectuals in uh, during the um, warlord decade were now, uh, you know, into their thirties and forties. And so were probably not all that pleased with the move back to traditional values. Um, so I did mention in my last video that with the Shanghai massacre and the completion of the Northern Expedition, um, China's story turns into one of two separate Chinas. There was the nationalist GMD China and the communist China. So this video has looked at the nationalists. Our next video will look at the communists. I've hope you, I hope you found this video useful and I will see you next time.